Thank you for listening to the Impact Leaders Podcast, featuring leaders in sustainable and impact investment, sharing their stories, experiences, and advice to increase awareness and highlight best practices in order to help us transition more capital into the industry faster. I am grateful that you're choosing to invest your time to listen to our guests, since I know that you're going to feel encouraged and inspired. I am JP Dalman, founder and CEO of ILM Partners, and we're the proud sponsors of the podcast. ILM Partners is an advisory and soon to launch multi-asset management firm targeting to acquire and scale investment funds focused on sustainability and impact, one of the fastest growing areas of investment management globally, enabling investors to generate returns with confidence whilst having a net positive impact in the world. Our mission is to facilitate and accelerate the transition of 5 billion of capital to sustainable impact investing in the next five years. If you would like to explore the opportunity of working together, email contact at ilmpartners.com for an introductory and confidential conversation. Your support means everything to us since it's what really keeps us going. So make sure you share our work with someone that will benefit from it. Please remember to subscribe to get the notifications and check the notes from each episode. We hope you enjoy today's special conversation. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Impact Leaders. I hope everyone is very well and healthy um, and managing the best you can. Uh, today's episode of Impact Leaders is technically the sixth on our current series uh, called Sustainable Investment Dilemma. Uh, looking into how industries can help address the climate and social crisis, in particular, the financial industry, uh, taking on the opportunity to find uh, and fund the solutions uh, that we need for a sustainable future. Although today we bring a different angle, uh, an industry to gain and give some extra inspiration to our listeners. Um, in order to do that, we have a very special guest today, and that is uh, yours truly, Sir Tim Smith. Good Welcome, afternoon. Thank uh, you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, how are you today? I am explosively good. I am very happy today. I like that. Uh, and and where, where are you today? I'm assuming Cornwall, but you never know. I'm, I'm in Cornwall. I am um, in the town of Wade Bridge on the River Camel, halfway between the north and the south. But I don't want to make your listeners jealous because I'm I'm literally only five miles from the beautiful north coast one way and 15 miles from the beautiful south coast the other. Must be so hard to be in London. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I don't share all the time, but we know we are uh, being listened in about over 100 countries. And, um, you know, the UK is kind of a big percentage, but uh, we, we, it's, it's quite nice, you know, that it has an international reach. So um, uh, if anyone... This is going to be interesting because it's another first for the episode, and maybe some people, you know, uh, may have never heard of Cornwall, uh, uh, and, and definitely some of the very exciting uh, and interesting parts that we're going to uh, talk about. You know, I'm sure that uh, people are going to be uh, extremely, extremely um, inspired. Um, and given that we will be focusing on some, uh, you know, I would put it within kind of the nature-based solutions. A part, I don't know if, you, if you'll agree, uh, including land regeneration and much more. I'm very excited uh, to have your team, you know, because I think that I'm looking forward to the kind of talking about some of the lessons learned and experience, uh, kind of the great need, you know, and potential to do more, you know, in terms of what, what you're doing and what needs to be done, uh, uh, specifically in some of the areas that you are working. Um, and how potentially, you know, the pandemic has impacted the way people um, investors and, 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 and companies and the way we look at nature and land and environment uh, 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 kind of has affects and provides for our societal needs and how it can have changed you know because I think that it's been a big a big um, or at least that's how it feels you know, when I talk to people that it's been a, 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 a kind of a swift or a change on the attention right so maybe I don't know if you want to comment on that first, and then I would like to give a proper introduction to, to, to you, if that's okay. Well, thank you. I think the pandemic has had a number of profound impacts. The first and little spoken about impact is every single CEO that I know, and I know a lot of them, has been more influenced by uh, 
their children over the breakfast table as they've been in lockdown, mm. talking about the world that they expect mummy or daddy to deliver for them uh, than anything else. I think any amount of environmental pressure groups could not have done anything like the power of all of the youngsters saying to their mums and dads, come on, step up to the plate. It's time of change and we want to make sure that we're proud of mummy and daddy. And I think that's really, really important. I think the other thing that uh, is interesting is the arrogance of nationhood has been proved to be just that when you see the way the pandemic has been no respecter at all of national boundaries. Uh, mm. And it has done in eight months what I think an education system would have taken between 30 and 50 years to do, which is to demonstrate that we are all interconnected. Mm. And I think this is a profound realization for a lot of people um, and I think sets us up beautifully to look at systems afresh in a way that is, yes, it's about the environment. Yes, it's about living within the boundaries of the planet. But most importantly, I mean, this is a business program that we're on here. It is actually waking people up to the fact that businesses are ecosystems and the way they operate, the way they manage, the moral compass for, by which they are set are all profound influences of the world within worlds that business represents. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And I can completely relate, relate to both points. You know, one, and I think I mentioned in one of my um, other episodes, you know, my daughter, after watching a Seaspiracy, came downstairs and banned us from uh, eating fish in the house, uh, which is, um, you know, quite quite um uh, quite something right uh, and then on the international business side um or the interconnectivity i would say you know is fascinating uh, you know i always mention to you offline how uh you know again it, and i should actually give it a, the credit straight away but the power of a, of clubhouse you know we connected and then we are connected with other people um and everyone is trying to you know contribute and help and support you know each other uh, at the personal and uh, business level. So yes, I, 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 I'm completely with you on that. Um, so um, let me take a minute or two. Uh, I'm going to just read a, a short version of your bio that I kind of collected, if that's okay. Um, Only if it's really short. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just for a bit of context, you know. So in case people haven't, haven't uh, met you before, um, you know, it's just that to share with the audience, you know, a, a short introduction to the outstanding and unique life I, I, I believe you, you, you have had so far, uh, you know, just for the context of the benefit. So, uh, and I like it because I'm going to say full name here is Sir Timothy Bartel Smith. And I know that you don't like being called Timothy because I learned that. Uh, but it's, uh, T Sir Tim uh, Smith, uh, KBE. Uh, he's a Dutch born British businessman. Uh, famous for his work on the Lost Gardens of Heligan and the Eden Project um, and the Charlestown Shipwreck and Treasure Center as well. Um, uh, yeah, that's another one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so he's the executive vice chair and co-founder of the multi-award winning Eden Project in Cornwall. Uh, since its opening in 2001, over 22 million people uh, have come to see uh, the, what was one a sterile pit and uh, now converted into something that is you know, beyond beautiful and educational at many levels, uh, to put it simple. Um, he's also the executive and co-chair of the Eden Project International, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, which aims to have an Eden Project on every habited continent by 2025. Uh, be interesting to see the, the, the vision and, and how it's going. Um, and he's also uh, obviously known you know, for, in, uh, for his, all his achievements in Cornwall, uh, uh, you know, that, that, this, that he discovered and restored the, the, the Lost Gardens on Heligan, which we'll mention with John Nelson, uh, which has been um, actually in, in 18, I think it was uh, awarded the Garden of the Year by BBC Country Life. Uh, and he also has a, a book about that and a book about the Eden Project, which you know, maybe we get the, the, the time as well to, to speak a little bit about. Uh, but the fascinating thing, you know, and I know, and that this is for my benefit as well, because you know, when we had the other conversation the other day, uh, I wasn't as prepared. Uh, the fascinating thing is that you started as an archeologist uh, before making kind of a, a move leap into music. Uh, and I had not realized, but you actually uh, received a, a platinum and gold discs. So 
it, it was not just a, a you know just a simple career right um and then obviously the the, the rest came you know they they lost the, the moving to 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 uh to Cornwall and the projects and uh, um, you know the initiative. At one point that I picked up, I do like numbers, and this is kind of uh, our audience tends to be investor focused. You know, you I think uh, the, the initial uh, uh, budget was of eighty million pounds to build the two transparent biomes uh, in an old China clay, but it's, it is said that you have uh, the project, you know, and, and the Eden project has contributed to over a billion pounds uh, uh, of kind of revenue into the Cornish economy. So it's, it's, it's fascinating to see, you know, all those points, I think. Uh, and then finally, finally, just to, to say, uh, I think it's, it's, it's very much worth um, to share, you know, that the fact that you got appointed honorary Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire, uh, which is the KBE, which I mentioned before in, tw in 2011. Um, and then there is something sp special as well in, I think in, in May 2012, when you became a British citizen, which is uh, which now you know. That's why I started with a third term before, but I don't think you actually use the third much. I've seen it around. It's always Tim Smith, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then lastly, which you taught me, which is the first thing already I learned, uh, your name is a, a palindrome. Ah, very good. Yeah, yeah, I made a note of that, which is because if you think people think about it, it's Tim Smith, so it reads both ways the same way. So we call it in Spanish Capicua, which is not doesn't sound as good as as as, as interesting, but <laughs> no, I like a Capicua. That's really good. Capicua. That, that, that's marvelous. And anybody listening who's got another good palindrome to share, I collect palindromes. I have my favorite one is a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Right, very nice. Okay, I like that. And then you mentioned one to me, since you mentioned that, there was one which is 240 words long. Ah, uh, yeah, that, gosh. George Parekh. George Parekh. Parek, yeah, the great French thinker and mathematician. He, um, no, it was 240 pages long. Page? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> no, this guy was, I mean, obviously, he, he would have been difficult to live with. But the the palindrome is in words, not the letters. It's not like Tim Smith. It would be it would end. Uh, it would be the words would be the same at the end. Are you with me? So yeah, it would be yeah. Smith, Tim at the end and Tim Smith at the other end of the all the sentences. But he, he also did. We you know he also did something absolutely mad. He wrote a detective novel in French without using the letter e. Yeah remember you mentioned that i mean that is just i i'm so full of admiration for doing something so useless and so brilliant <laughs> well that i can remember now but there's a book about that about doing uh, and uh, i was at an event i remember uh, it was about doing things that we think are useless but that can become uh, very uh, impactful over time right and, and many of those things actually are in science you know to begin with uh, which yeah. people don't believe in but let, let me start with the first question which is uh, um, what what is sustainable and impact investing uh, to, to your eyes and, and experience uh, Tim uh, gosh I love those trivial questions straight off <laughs> um, okay first of all I think the distinction between investment and impact investment is childish because all investment has an impact therefore uh to deny that is actually in a sense to try and make something uh positive in terms of what is called sustainability out of impact investing but i think an awful lot of what is called impact investing isn't actually that impactful i think it often it often gets greenwashed at one level but is also mm -hmm. intellectually uh sometimes um not as intelligent as it could be by which I mean the following. You said that uh, Eden actually has created over 2.2 billion pounds of extra wealth. The wow. Wales statistic. But the reason is because of our politics. I am commercial. Although the Eden project is a charitable trust, it is run by companies of whom the shareholders are the charity. So what we are doing is trying to make profits or surpluses for it with a purpose. Because I am, I'm a great believer that uh, except when it is your intent not to make a surplus and you have deliberately said, I am not going to, and the surplus will be in terms of brand or welfare or something else, 
Um, I believe that it's a good measure of the effectiveness with which you operate if you can make a surplus uh, uh, as measured by whatever the definition is you have of that surplus. So at Eden, um, I was much I was much influenced by something that happened to me right at the beginning, which may be very interesting to uh, your listeners. I went to a town called Cumbran, uh, which is in Wales in 1996 when i decided to build the eden project i thought i would go to visit the people who had organized the last big event in britain which was a garden festival paid for by the government um they took place every four years and they, they had begun in 1984 uh, and this was going to be the last one and it had not been a great success I went to see the people who had run this garden festival and I was the luckiest man in the world. The people who ran it decided they would share with me every mistake that they had made. Mm. And I'm absolutely honest about this. I would have made half of those mistakes myself had I not been warned. And the advice they gave is just brilliant. And I now give it to everybody else I talk to. The first thing they said was the problem is when we arrived here, we saw our whales, as in Wales, the country, we saw our whales, we did not stop to see the real whales. They brought with them all the prejudice they had or pre-thoughts they had about what whales was, and they missed some very, very big tricks. Wales was famous for big industry, big steel, big coal, and so on. But actually, at the time of the... Um, garden festival big steel and coal were in huge decline and many many of the tens of thousands of unemployed people had formed small businesses and so their first advice was if we had known if we had thought we would have started planning two years before we did so that all of these small businesses could have benefited from what we were going to be doing at the garden festival as it was we came so late to the table that only six months before did we think about ordering the uniforms we needed, the stuff for the shops, the catering, or you know, all of the stuff, mm. which meant that almost all the money that was meant to be invested in Wales through that garden festival hemorrhaged to big companies outside Wales. And that, yes. re that really made me think about Eden. So when we began building the Eden project, well before the foundations went in, we had started to talk to companies that were going to supply us. We started talking to the colleges about the sort of staff we would need. And all the it, local like, stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and it was revolutionary because it meant that we were able to take our local stakeholders, as you rightly call them, with us on the journey. Also, also, and this is a criticism of many commercial people, we thought about what do local businesses need if they're going to supply something that is going to become big. You know as well as I do, JP, that if you are a small ice cream maker and you have only short-term contracts, but you need to treble your company, is there any bank that is going to lend you the money to treble your company in terms mm. of what you can do? No, there isn't. That is why you must be positive in your capitalism. If you're going to do this, give your ice cream supplier a three-year contract and tell them that if they have all sorts of performance points that they uh, that we demand like having zero waste and so on at the end of three years you will extend that contract by being by using capitalist processes commercial processes we were able to have huge environmental impact and business impact in terms of creating solidity a reason for training a reason for interconnection in term in, in in truth what we were doing was creating a system all around us that was going to be mutually uh, beneficial and we're very very proud of that and that is why we're now building in many countries of the world because the citizens who are in those countries have approached us and said we want our towns our cities to benefit by that type of thinking okay that's fascinating. So can I just double check two things? So what was the so the point one was the lessons, right? So they brought kind of they, they brought or they, they looked at the old whales. And the second one? 
the, the second one is if you really want to create environmental System. and and economic advantage in your local community you must understand the processes of contract and supply chain and procurement right. and, and deliver those for the people you want to be long-term partners for you. I hear you, I hear you. And, 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 and just out of curiosity, is the garden festival still going? No. No. The garden, no. The, What's that, it was called? The, that was the last garden festival. Right. But look, your question was about what does impact investment mean to me? Yes, I, and I and I wrote it like this way. So if I had to like from what I listen, it's a commercially focused system, mutually mutually beneficial to all the stakeholders. That's what I heard. Yes, to which I would add that true impact investment would understand also that it would be investing in terms of creating systems reinforcing systems part of the problem we all face is that the things that we are trying to deal with are called by academics wicked problems or super wicked problems and that when you have a situation where so far commercialism capitalism if you like the the the, the global compact is focused on maximizing a short-term prosperity profit Whereas I think impact investment, uh, true impact investment, is, is, is attuned with that word legacy. It is also attuned with the concept of there being planetary boundaries. It is also attuned to the, 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 the human-made constraints of the sustainable development goals. It surely must be, or else you cannot be called an impact investment. Mm. And then many of your listeners will be thinking, uh, okay, how does one create a sustainable uh, financial um, uh, financial stroke commercial uh, ecology that enables it to do the job to be impactful? Because the truth is, as you know, that you cannot impact invest if you haven't got enough money or enough intelligence to create the systems to make it a bit like a friendly invading eco economic army. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that if you can't do the whole job, you could end up doing a lot of damage. Mm. So in Australia, there's a, a, a big inv inv impact investment fund. We know very well that we've been talking to. They've bought 75,000 hectares of degraded cattle land. And you will know that there are many funds actually like that. Look, at, for example, in Mexico, in Argentina, um, where people are buying large chunks of land for impact investment. And their version of impact investment is actually allied to regenerative farming or doing ecologically sustainable things on the land that they have purchased. And their single market is actually, well, their biggest single market is the carbon sequestration potential mm -hmm. in terms of the carbon price on the land that they have. I think this is actually quite stupid. I mean, the two big funds we're talking about we've got them very excited about how do you create a mixed economy on land that you are regenerating, but also realizing that you want to, in any country that will stop the big drift of humans to the cities and create in what was the countryside, the abilities for people to have full lives that are living within planetary boundaries. And that's, for example, what you're seeing now in China. You're seeing that in China where they're trying to move people out of cities by creating in the countryside the things or potential to enjoy those things which people were previously going to cities for. I hear you. I hear you. Um, and one, one, yeah, and one point you mentioned there um, that kind of resonated, um, and, and this is fascinating because, as obvious as it is, I don't think that people think about it. But the point about um, reinforcing the, the the system and the local ecosystem uh, a, a, a wonderful man i met also through clubhouse Stuart williams out of uh, uh, charleston in, in south carolina he's an impact investor and he was giving some of the statistics of how much of the um, kind of revenue created you know in the state they calculate that goes out you know, to others, right? So, which I think is the main, the point you mentioned about the the story with the with the with the garden um, uh, event, right? Um, yeah. 
and, and it's and it's um you know to be you know truly impactful at that level you know people need to start getting that notion that you need to start looking uh, and i'm just again fascinated by the thought of you know how the planning ahead and including all the stakeholders which again a lot of people don't realize that you need to do a bit like gardening you need to prepare the grounds right yes. a lot. you have to work on it a lot before you can plant before you can actually see anything coming out uh, just to to mention an analogy um a second part of this question you know is uh, and it kind of links to this so you know the fact that we are growing the fact that we are we are, we, we are you know growing the cities you know populations now we're trying to pull people outside of cities you know uh, and there is um, i don't know if you have seen but the sustainable investment it can are we facing a sustainable investment dilemma that's the question and it came out out of the fact that we've been funding you know the financial services uh, uh, industry uh, banks in particular have been funding those same um, uh, products and solutions that have created the problem right um, so in your view and perhaps also from you know the work that you are doing, do you do you see that dilemma uh, in terms of you know what we're where we're putting the money versus what we're doing taking the action? Um, if I was answering honestly, I just basically see stupid middle-aged men making really bad investments. I don't see a fundamental contradiction uh, here at all. I think the trouble is too many people are like sheep and they do not think. I'll give you an example. Right. You and I are going to do some impact investing. We'll go to Argentina. Right. I will tell you a word which is incredibly damaging, which everybody thinks is very wholesome. Farm. The word farm, you cannot help it. Almost anybody who hears the word farm, they see a cockerel, they see chickens, they see pigs, a few livestock, beautiful fields and all the rest of it. If you stopped calling these places farms and talk to them as being rural centers, you would then revolutionize the way you look at the countryside. You would actually see rural centers where you should have urban outposts, sorry, outposts for urban schools to go into the country to learn what the country that they live in is. They should be places of health and well-being where people who have suffered various calamities in their life can come and recharge their batteries all of these things uh, education and well-being are really major ones but within it also is access to the land for people who have not been farmers all their lives who do not want to form a farm you know twenty thousand hectares of soy or something like that we're seeing this in britain there are young kids in the age group 19 to, let's say, 27. I've made that up, but mm -hmm. in that age, who desperately want to grow things and want to create markets out of what they grow, niche products to create niche forms of food and drink. And they're very successful. They can make money on five to seven acres of you know, in, in new money, call it three to four hectares. Yeah. Um, and we're not doing nearly enough to encourage people to see the land as being a joyous way of both both uh, nurturing our populations, creating a range of new businesses, um, because no one is looking at the land in terms of regenerating it other than making the soil healthier. So if you and I go to Argentina and we take over, because it's a round figure, a thousand hectares of land, and we then say we want 100 Argentinian young couples to come and share that land, right? And we're not only going to do that, we are going to create small factories on that land where they can make the whole process work of the crops that they're growing, the processing of them, the packaging of them, so that you can, all of what you want to make as your final product, you're keeping in lo muscular, local, mm -hmm. Uh, centers. You will revolutionize the countryside, you will stop people leaving the countryside, and then people in the cities will start to see the countryside as being an adjunct, an addition to themselves, rather than a rather strange place that you just go on holiday. Mm. Mm. I, yeah, I, yeah, I can relate um, uh, quite, uh, yeah, personally, I can relate because I've moved from the city out to the countryside, I interestingly fought it uh, at the beginning because it wasn't my idea. <laughs> but uh, as I've uh, 
as I kind of learn to, and I actually COVID help even more, you know, learn to embrace it. Uh, you understand, you know, that is the most wonderful and beautiful option you can actually have. Um, but we have a fascination for cities still. I, I would have, I would have, I would have said, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, but the the intellectual wealth, the cultural wealth of going to a marvelous city, whether it be London or Paris or Buenos Aires or Berlin, whatever. I mean, mm. the, the, most of the great cities of the world are great cities because you are suddenly reintroduced to the mass of humanity from all over the world, which makes you feel as if you've fallen into the most gorgeous cultural soup. Mm. Uh, and you miss that when you go into the countryside you miss that and i think it's childish for either you or i to pretend that the countryside is better in everything it isn't you want a, a, a rich life is a polymathic life with different interests mm. you know? mm -hmm. and uh, on, on uh, let me just add the slight turn but based on what you just talked about because it's fascinating you mentioned the commerciality uh, effectively, when you talked about changing the name of farms to rural centers, you're talking about um, a little bit of uh, marketing uh, slash, you know, PR there as well. So all very commercial uh, ways, you know, to just, you know, re repackage you know, the, 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 something that we have a, a, an emotional association to to make it even more attractive, right? Yeah. Um, which brings me to something. So I picked up uh, uh, you know, through the some of the preparation, some of the comments you have made uh, about um, uh, social enterprise and entrepreneurship, for example. Right? Yeah. And, and this is something that you just actually hit the, on, on, on the head of the nail on something that I keep seeing on entrepreneurs coming and ask me. And not even entrepreneurs, I've seen it actually, uh, entrepreneurs, and I've seen it with large institutions, investment management firms that are trying to launch you know, impact funds, for example, or sustainable uh, investment products, uh, that they're missing some of the points around how to speak about it, how yeah. to convey the message, how to explain, you know, what they're trying to do, uh, and then connect that to the needs of the, in this case, the investors. But the same happens, you know, when you go all the way down to somebody that wants to set up a needed project for the project for the first time, or somebody that's just trying to create a um, you know, a, a renewable packaging uh, a product fir firm, right? So, but you mentioned a, a couple of points about how we are about risk uh, in the UK, particularly how, you know, the stigma of failure. So any, anything that you can share uh, around that, you know, and, and specifically the mindset I was thinking, what is the mindset that somebody is trying to do something social or environmentally impactful needs to think about? Well, yeah. I, one of the things, though, JP, I'm I'm finding really difficult is you're 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 trying to put me into uh, a mm -hmm. slot, a definition of environmental or whatever. I'm interested in everything, absolutely everything, mm -hmm. because I think everything needs to work with everything else in order for us to have a healthy planet, and that is why I I am commercially interested. I uh, I I spend a lot of my time thinking about the interface between being commercial. Uh, and ending up with the social ends that we all think would be highly desirable in our culture. And no country has yet managed to succeed in this area. So it is quite obvious we are not clever enough. Whether you be in Argentina or France or America or England, we all recognize that it is a shameful thing that the gap between the poor and the rich in each of those marvelous countries is greater today than it was 100 years ago. This is quite frankly disgusting and it's really disgusting because those of us who consider ourselves to be commercial get tainted or stained by the notion that it is it is a it is a flaw of capitalism that there will always have to be huge depths of uh, uh, reserves of the have nots to serve those who have and this is just quite simply not true it is to do with the poverty of moral compass within many of the practitioners of capitalism we should not all be stained by the bad behaviors of others let me put it to you this way do you personally jp believe that clean water ought to be available to all and that anybody who actually pollutes the clean water which is the commons is committing an offense do you 
Yes and yes. Okay. So you are a capitalist, I am a capitalist, and I still think it's almost treasonable to life on Earth to poison the rivers. Therefore, why are we not strong enough as people to say, I'm a capitalist, but you, sir, are a bastard for actually poisoning our river, and you should be put out of business. End of story. This is nothing to do with capitalism. It is to do with the unacceptable greed of people who do not pay the true price for maintaining nature in the balance it should have been in the, in, in the first place. The same goes if I ask that question about clean air, you would say yes and yes. If I ask you, do you think it should be criminal for people to so degrade the land that it is turned to dust and is infertile to mm. turn to the microphone, you'd say yes. These are just simple judgments about being citizens of planet Earth. And I think it is the duty of capitalism to make sure that if pulling down the wall in 1989 was the great victory of capitalism, the greatest challenge of the 50 years since then has got to be to prove it was worth winning. And if we can't make sure that our, our children live in, in an environment in which the air isn't poisoned or the rivers aren't poisoned and the soil is producing food, then we have failed. The system has failed. Um, and I believe very much actually in the power of commerce and capitalism to be a power for good and i think the weakness I mean. back to middle-aged men is an awful lot of good people have stood around while a lot of bad people have actually managed to pervert the english language or whichever language they're speaking to imply that commerce is good at any price it is not to be honest, I think that the, the ultimate thing under any company, if we're talking about in, uh, impact investment, is that in no case ever, in no case ever, should the law of the marketplace trump the laws of nature. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, um, I think that it, it, all points, you know, extremely powerful, and I got a lot more that I bargained for on that on that on that on that question <laughs> because uh, and, and just for the record you know for 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 you and for for everyone listening so it's not i think that i am you know uh, uh, i don't know if you use the word painting you know but painting you as a uh, as a neither you know an environmentalist or anything like that you know i completely get it you know i am a, a capitalist myself and i really picking up on that commercial point you know which i really appreciate because it's what i'm trying to teach you know people uh, uh at all levels uh with with some of the you know even even a program we just launched this week is it, it was born out of that because i realized that there is that gap where there is some people trying to do great good but they just don't have this um let's put a simple commercial skills to be able to then make a sustainable business model uh, and then in that case, you know, you cannot have any impact, right? So put it simply, you know, it's profit and impact. And I have it more clear than ever before, you know, you have to create profit and so that you can have an impact. Uh, uh, all obviously with the work that you do that you do before to understand what the impact that you're going to create is going to be, which is what I'm picking up from you. So, and if I speak like that, by the way, Tim, is because I think the podcast, I tend to speak like that. It's kind of, it's around the environment and, and, yeah. uh, and normally on the investment side, but that's fine. Can I throw a challenge down at you then? Please, please. Okay. All right. Um, we, I just talked about clean water. If you do believe, like I do, that clean water ought to be available to everybody on Earth, normally when I speak to a large audience, I ask them a question. I say, how many people in this room donate small amounts of money every month to those lovely charities that uh, provide clean water around the world? And most of the room will put a hand up. Then ask the next question. How many people in this audience believe those charities are capable of creating clean water or delivering clean water to the world? And no one will put their hand up. No one, not a single person. And the thing that really, really pisses me off about the current debate about any subject is the way we have painted ourselves into corners of prejudice because you know what the only companies that could actually or organizations that could provide clean water all over the world have names which most activists 
could hardly bear to do other than spit out. They're called BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, Aramco. You keep on, Total, you keep naming them. So who in our culture is starting a discourse which enables a positive dialogue to take place between big old capital to enable them to reinvent themselves on behalf of all of our citizens to run successful clean companies because no company I know has ever changed its mind about something or changed its direction of travel through being screamed at or shouted at. So who, in your opinion, who can have that discussion? It is so important for society and planet Earth, yet nowhere do I look politically in any system. Is there anybody talking about capitalism with a moral compass that re redresses uh, some of the old technologies that no longer suit our direction of travel to make sure we don't lose all the talents that are so crucial for the future of project management, technology, all of that sort of stuff. We cannot afford to lose those talents. So how can you have that invitation to big companies to come to the table to use their power and their intelligence for a different purpose? Okay. I'm going to I'm going to take that one away I think Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and that, but what I will do as well is I will pass on the challenge to anyone listening uh, and do share because what I'm uh, you know as I connect more and more with people around the world I I I keep learning about so many great initiatives taking place um you know like um I, I, again the the one thing I think you make a point is that um that is hard to see sometimes is where all the different and I, just to use the word again all the different stakeholders are coming together so you mentioned all the big brands uh, you know they have that sometimes they have their initiatives you know we are for example trying to um, um, uh, help support uh, unilever in delivering their transformation project for latam for example but it's very specific you know to the sector to the products uh, what you're talking about is something kind of a couple of levels above I would say in terms of you know that conversation um and then obviously i see as we know right the different um the different uh, organizations around the world in the different sectors like the world economic forum or you know yeah. the g7 and it's going to happen near you i think um yeah. and, and and others right but uh that kind of all round table conversation uh, yes, uh, if anyone knows as well, please reach out and, and let me know. Aside from, and even even like we have COP26, uh, right, coming up uh, in six months in Scotland. Uh, it's fascinating to see now, you know, through again, I'm going to mention Clubhouse maybe more times than ever in this episode, but, you know, there through there you realize that there's still a disconnect between, you know, people going to that event and the rest of the population, right, which is, tends to be this kind of elite versus the masses, right? Uh, which I observe, um, but um, and even you know I I I I don't know what point we we I was I was gonna the best the best time to mention this, but even I think you are looking at doing a project for the UK with philanthropy on the Eden project soon as well, which is just to again bring a group of people together uh, uh, with a common interest, right? Um, so um, well, we've been doing. <laughs> We've been doing quite a lot of that since 2009. We've had an event called the Big Lunch, which is um, got royal patronage and things. But the idea was simply to knock on the door of your neighbours and have lunch because any any area where you get to know your neighbours actually becomes a neighbourhood. Um, and one of the problems is a lot of people lazily talk about community as being a line on a map. It isn't. Community comes from a word. Do it. Mm word communos together in gift it's about action it's not about inaction so um we have about six and a half million people a year do that and uh, in terms of convening people in terms of business leaders and all of that sort of stuff we do we do it but actually we're becoming less interested in it um i know that prince charles has started terracotta mm -hmm. Uh, which I think is a really good initiative. Um, but I'm actually more focused personally on um, education. I'm 
passionate about education, but not the sort of education which is the sort of thing where parents go, oh, isn't that nice? That's a really worthwhile thing. It's about how do you create citizens? I mean, the big battleground for you, for me, for everybody listening is how do we stop just being consumers and start talking about ourselves as citizens that have responsibility? I mean, you will have noticed, I mean, the uh, the lack of respect for politicians, which is yes. felt all over the world. This isn't just Britain or America or whatever, but in large part, it's our fault. It's our fault. The, the most expensive, um, expensive, the most watched uh, thing we have at the Eden Project is a big wall on which someone has painted um, if the world was shrunk to a village of 100 people and with it, there are all these statistics about the demographics of where people would have come from, um, the income groups, the life expectancy, their access to various resources and the public just cannot help themselves. They're so fascinated. The moment you've got down to 100 people, they can now in their head start to understand ideas, which when you talk about thousands, millions, billions, you can't. And something we do at Eden is, is, is we do when we get people together we say right um, if we lived for example in Wadebridge where I live and we put a castle wall right around Wadebridge, Wadebridge what do we need we need to have some people that stop wolves eating us we need people to pick up our sewage and you know you make a list of all of it and at the end of it you realize that you will be costing three times more than you will earn in taxes because we the citizens want that right? Like consumers, spoiled children, we want that. So the politicians cannot succeed now. They cannot succeed because we want, and we use the word they must do, to politicians to give us what we have ridiculously asked for. The next part of this conversation for any, car, for any person or business ought to be, okay, what cost can we take out of this system by, okay, I will mow the lawns, the public lawns, you will do the hedges, you will do the litter, you know, you just take the cost down until you've got something that you can afford. But we never have that sort of education in, in schools or anything. Ridiculously, we want to learn about the medieval kings and queens of Britain or something rubbish like that. But we won't want to teach people how to grow something or how to cook something or how to have a conversation that doesn't end in war. There you go. I've stopped ranting. No, no, that's gold. That's gold. Because, uh, and, and, uh... Let me just see if I can keep my, my, my thoughts, my, my mental notes as well and make sense of what I'm going to say. But before I forget, uh, communes, communities, together in gift. Is that yeah. what you said? I'm, I'm going yeah. I'm, I'm to make that because, you know, I've been uh, truly enjoying uh, my, first, um, uh, my first experience of the most wonderful community, you know, with my uh, church in Tunbridge Wells. Um, uh, which I have never experienced it and that, at that level. Uh, and then it just fascinates me together in gift that you mentioned that I've learned another, another uh, meaning. Thank you for that. Um, and then also I take advantage to um, share the light uh, on the back of Terra Carta. There is the Sustainable Markets Initiative. If people in the sector haven't heard about it, you know, I've just met with uh, a, a friend a colleague of mine uh, recently, Stephen Lissers, and he told me about it, and it's fascinating what they're, what they're doing. You know, not, it's not only locally, but uh, uh, across the, common, the Commonwealth. Um, and, then, uh, and then, again, I'm, I'm kind of taking a, a, taking a turn from the questions I have prepared, but I have to ask you, so how do we change the, the and I know that we can talk for hours on this just alone, Tim, but how, how do we change that part about the education? Because I live, I see with my daughters, you know, I, they, they, what they're learning, how they're learning, uh, and the system continues, and even in some of the best schools, you know, in the country, uh, in this case, right? So, what what does it need to what does need to happen, so that we have that change to become more practical and commercial and 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 set people for a sustainable society? Well. As a question, it's a brilliant question which completely soothes the vanity of anybody asked it. Um, a dear friend of mine uh, who sadly died in August was Sir Ken Robinson, who was the you know, god of creative education. And we became very good chums late in his life and he joined our board at Eden. And he said to me something very interesting. He said, 
if I was given a thousand pounds for every time someone has suggested what the curriculum should be, hmm. change the world, I would be a billionaire. He said, the truth is, it's not really as simple as what's in the curriculum. It is about your approach to education and making a distinction between qualification and an education. Um, and in an education, you are trying to fitness train your curiosity in the world. You're trying to understand how systems work together. Um, and you're also trying to discover at a fundamental level what for you personally are the elements that make you happy. Um, I've seen, because it's an interest, I've seen lots of stuff on this. And it is true. There's a school, a very famous school that some people listening may have heard of called the Manchester Project in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. where uh, Bill Strickland, who started it, uh, he had been a homeless boy in his youth, and then eventually, through one twist of fortune or another, he went to Harvard, came back to Pittsburgh, and built this school. And he wouldn't let people study anything until they had discovered the colours that were important to them. They had painted for long enough, they'd used crayons, and then they had to play musical instruments, and then they had to learn to cook. He actually reckoned that most people were unhappy because they had no sense of taste. No sense of taste at all. Their version of taste was to listen to their peer group telling them that this was a good book or that was a good piece of music or that was a so-and-so. Because people took away their crayons and musical instruments far too early for them to actually come to terms with what their taste was. Isn't it interesting how we have the collectivization of taste through all the magazines you have and the rest of it. Why is that? It's because of the crashing insecurity that most people feel. You watch a bunch of middle-class people go around an art gallery and you'll, you'll notice two things. One of which is people will only be confident in saying that something's a lovely piece of work generally if they know it's by someone everybody else has said is famous. Hmm. The lack of confidence in terms of knowing what is good taste or bad taste or whatever, it is, it is a sadness for all of us. It is all of us. So when you talk about education systems, I think the first thing is we need to put on a pedestal that if the most important things we have in our lives are our children, what on earth are we doing in trusting our children to the people who are in charge of them, i.e. we are making them in loco parentis, should they not be the most important people in society? I would have thought that, I mean, with all respect to everybody else listening, I would have thought that to be an impact investor is of less importance or should be of less importance in terms of social prestige than being an absolutely fantastic teacher. But because we don't revere education in the way that we should and take it a bit for granted, we have not built the infrastructure to both encourage and, uh, 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 and, and inform teachers to become the very best they can be, nor yet given them the resources to give to our children the experiences which would be truly marvelous. Is it possible? Of course it is. Of course it is. We're humans, we're capable of getting better, but we actually need to, if, if hmm. when you went to college, right, is it or is it not true that for other than for people who'd already got a degree and were going for a second additional qualification to enable them to teach, is it not true that the education college, the teacher's training college, was not accorded the same intellectual respect as those that were studying the big subjects? It's true, isn't it? Mm. We have actually managed to devalue teaching and we need to work out ways of increasing the nobility of that public service. Mm. Yes. One, one, one thing that, again, sometimes it's uh, hard to admit the ignorance, but, you know, as I am still, you know, growing up uh, and learning, you know, and that's why, you know, I, I very much enjoy. And again, I really, truly appreciate, you know, your time and, and, and being with us and, sharing your your thinking because it's through these conversations and i hope that people listening you know will benefit uh, because this is fascinating the, the everything you just said in terms of how we are conditioned you know the brain doesn't the brain has all this power but it doesn't seem to be able to 
set the fire, right? Until something ignites it. So lots, lots of things that you're saying, I think are gonna really help for people to think because as I've learned, you know, and I moved to the UK to become an investment banker and I was blessed to make it, you know, into the industry. And then you go in and you realize how incredible intelligent people are, you know, when they create, basically, we've been very good at creating services, right? That's one of the things that we export. Uh, so financial services products is one of them. Uh, sometimes when you see people creating their, the derivative products, for example, which is basically out of air uh, to, to help clients, you know, technically, but to make, you know, a lot of money. Uh, it always uh, fascinates me how we, we, we do all of these, but we cannot do the same to create, you know, benefits, societal benefits and other benefits, uh, which I think is all coming back to my mind when you mention all these points uh, about how, how we value and how we approach things. Uh, and then because we're doing, we're doing that, we're so busy, we don't take the time to reflect on some of these points. Um, and then I'll, I'll briefly mention the fact that it's fascinating that you did archaeology, right, to start with. Uh, and then archaeology and anthropology yeah and, it, and it's fascinating and then uh, one of the people i interviewed for the podcast is the ceo of hermes uh, 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 Sakhar Nusebi. you know he did history and in, in this country is the one place where i've seen people that do you know all sorts of degrees and end up doing you know all sorts of other activities you know which i haven't seen maybe in other countries um uh, so I'm, I'm learning to value so much more the thinking and the approaches rather than the qualifications. Uh, and, and well, you made a point about education, right? And how we can change it and think about it. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, if we don't mind, let me, can I just move to talking um, some more about kind of the organizations, you know, and effectively they're called trust, you know, but, but companies that you are working, uh, that you created uh, so that people again, learn about it, but also, Get some of the inspiration in terms of you know how you are approaching it. So if I had to summarize it, you know you have the Eden Trust, which is the the, um, uh, the registered charity uh, yeah. number one zero nine three zero seven zero. If anyone wants to make a donation, uh, um, and then you have Eden International, right, which sits within that, but is effectively a you know, and, and I don't know, an arm, I would call it, or, 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 as, as I see for now. Um, and then specifically, you have also, I call it the drilling project, but uh, I, I know that has a, 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 a more, more sophisticated and, and, and technical name to it. So uh, would you mind just sharing, you know, some of uh, the work that you're doing uh, so that people understand, uh, because it's quite, it's quite vast, really, so. Well, uh, I'll start with the drilling project. Uh, for 10 years, we've been trying to raise the money in order to build a deep geothermal energy plant. We wanted, uh, it's a very simple principle. Everybody listening will understand it. Jules Verne would love it. Um, we, you drill down, in our case, about 4.7 kilometers uh, into granite. We, we, are, we're, we live in an area of uh, a, a big granite extrusion, which is which which is where heat is closer to the surface uh, than going to be. You can find heat anywhere because the center of the Earth is very very hot. In fact, the very center of the Earth is hotter than the surface of the Sun. Um, but and you're just digging slightly into what's called the mantle. You have the crust, which is the soil, and then you have the mantle, if you like, under it, which is the rock, uh, the rock uh, uh, area. We've started drilling uh, five days ago. Uh, the intention is that when we get to the 4.7 kilometers, the hot air, the hot water will 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 be brought. To the, we pump down cold water, which comes through, goes over the granite, heats up a superheated steam, and comes to the surface and gives us as much hot water as we need. Uh, and assuming the temperature is right, we can use heat exchangers, and it can then heat. Uh, other water up to uh, uh, the steam required to power a turbine for about 3.4 megawatts, which would mean that the Eden project would have all the heat and power it needs and would also be able to deliver the same to 17,000 other houses nearby. Our ambition is that once we've proven this case, there's a large amount of granite near us and we would then uh, grow this business very rapidly because mm -hmm. just the Cornubian, the corn, the, the corn will, um, rock is sufficient to provide all of the heat and power for the whole country of Britain, 20% of it. And I actually think that one of the big challenges for the UK 
is to suddenly allow people to rid themselves of all the brainwashing that they had about fossil fuels and realize that in a very short period of time, if we um, uh, change the way we look at the world, we could become completely energy independent. Now, anybody who lives on an island anywhere must surely realize that with the lessons of history, it is wise for nations that are islands to be dependent on nobody out of their, outside their islands for anything that is vital to their existence. I would suggest that uh, the growing of food and the production of energy would be the two key things, and you'd want to do that in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, so anyway, we, we are hoping that in five months time, the heat will come up. Uh, and we're also going to put solar panels all over our car parks and walkways. So we will be so carbon negative um, that uh, my, my bet with my colleagues is we will be so carbon negative that even if every single one of our visitors visited from the planet Venus, we would still be carbon negative. Hmm. Um, that is a deliberate uh, ploy. I'm a big fan of Buckminster Fuller, the late Buckminster Fuller, who designed the geodesic dome, which is the shape which makes up what Eden looks like with pentagons and hexagons. And he wrote the most extraordinary book called An Operating Manual to Spaceship Earth. And we are changing our Eden project, um, both here and all over the world, to make sure that we are uh, turning ourselves into circular systems. We're moving our sewage and our water systems over the next six months to create systems whereby we can not only process everything on site, but we can use the wasted nutrients as feed for prawns and for fish and give us 200 tonnes of those and grow 40% of the vegetables that we will need on site. And we're going to basically analyze to death everything that's happening in our land uh, to, re to remove waste and so on. And the, and the last point I would make about, you asked about the energy project, but it's actually right at the heart of what we're calling Eden 2.0, which is how do we make the uh -huh. site uh, independent? Um, and we're hoping that within, uh, within three years, we will be energy independent 40% uh, food independent, but growing every, growing everything we do eat within one and a half kilometers of our gates. Um, and the most important aspect is that a lot of impact investment talks about circular economies. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to let people listening know what a true circular economy is. What, the best way of explaining it is that in nature, there is no waste there is no country called a way to which you throw things. That, that means that the biodegradation of everything you create in nature, you get to eaten by other things. Now, a circular economy is only a circular economy of any, of any benefit if you're not circulating horrible rubbish. Uh, you don't want to keep circulating arsenic or single-use plastics in a particularly negative way. And a lot of people don't understand that. It's not just circular. They also use words like um, end of life. It's about doing things for end of life. Again, this is um, woolly headed thinking. Most of the issues that you know and I know need sorting could be sorted with a change of legislation, which made sure that everything that is made has got to have an end of purpose, not an end of life. It's an end of use, mm. which means that as you design your refrigerator or your other white goods i'm just making it could be anything that before it's even used as a washing machine you already know what that metal or type of junction box or whatever will be used for in its next recycling really healthy circular economies will have a genealogy of use already uh, interpreted or roughed out and planned for them before you begin i tell you what i mean that whole notion i'm sure it's happened to you your dvd breaks down you want to get it mended it's cheaper to buy a new one than even mending it that is disgusting it is utterly disgusting that we have enshrined in our processes that sort of waste and that's what you need people on this call to be doing the lawyers are on it or whatever is to think how can you create legislation which would make a pirate smile that's what you need to do. How could you create a taxation system which isn't about 
uh, we're going to just touch tax the rich. It's actually about how do we encourage great investment? You know, just imagine if you were going to invest in, in, in impact investment and you didn't want to take any money out for 10 years, right? Let's say, right? Yes, brilliant, mm -hmm. right? Let's imagine the tax was just 10% for that. Profits from that, just 10%. You know, and the shorter it was, the tax rate just goes up and up and up and up and up and up. I mean, you, this would be much more your skill. But if you were acting as a citizen, you know, if you're acting as a citizen, that's what I think you'd be doing. And that is why I personally believe, and I will make a lot of enemies with my next sentence, I personally believe that the profession of accountancy, its purity in the form of audit, audit should be removed as a profession. I do not believe it is actually a profession. I believe it is an act of treason because as a profession, if they had actually had citizenship in mind, they would have gone back to the Roman use of the word audare to listen, which is where auditing came from. They have never for one moment made any intelligent suggestion about how their profession can help the citizen, only the shareholder. I think they are a disgrace. I'm just saying this is a discussion point. And for all of you who are auditors out mm -hmm. there, I'm sure you're very nice and we'd enjoy a drink together, but the shame on you for your lack of activity on behalf of all of our citizens. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to pause there for a second for people to swallow that one. Uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, for what it's worth, you know, I'll 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 take it. And by the way, I I you may not know this, but you know, I started my career as an auditor at PwC. Oh, oh no. <laughs> so, but but you know, I'm not an auditor, uh, <laughs> and I'm not in one of those firms. Uh, but um, anymore, I have, of, I have a lot of friends who are auditors anymore. But I have somebody. I have people very close to me that are you know, so uh, very interesting. But um. One one thing, um, oh, I escaped my mind now with that. that I think the laughter just. But, but can I just ask you a question then, JP? Yeah. Which is. Ah, Saspi. I was going to mention Saspi. I remember. Yeah, go on. Oh, sorry. All my friends who are auditors just look at me as if I'm being a dreamer, right? When I say to them, why on earth have you allowed this nonsense of, uh, 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 of corporate social responsibility? Um, an ESG to develop. Why? Why have you allowed something which is purest greenwashing and rubbish to develop when you could have actually thought of a, 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 a law, a regulated system for companies to operate, which meant that it wasn't an externality, it, it, that, that all externalities which belong to us, the citizens, would be mm -hmm. taken account of. And it's not difficult. The great late lawyer, Stephen Lloyd, made a proposition which I was fully in support of. If every company in return for being registered as of limited liability had to donate one special golden share to the nation, it would mean the auditors would have to say, has this company poisoned the water, the air or the mm. soil of the nation? And that is not preposterous. It is a moral position. Mm. Mm. No, I think, you know, if I had to, you no know, no answering for everyone, but, you know, some of the reflections I've been having is where the, uh, I think it's, it's morality, but then the, I, I do use a lot of the word integrity, you know, this kind of double standard between providing the service to certify something is being done according to the inverted commas standards. Uh, and again, it's very, easy not really but very easy to just adhere to you know financial standards as such uh, almost you know and detached from the externalities you mentioned um but as stupid as it may sound i just think that humans have not really evolved to understand that until now i think the awakening if i don't know if that's the best word to use is kind of happening at last no, but I was there, you know, I couldn't see this, you know, I, I started developing that. Uh, well, funny enough, a friend of mine started calling a, a call to Jesus moment, although I, I, I kind of reconnected or was reborn as a Christian only two years and a half ago. But uh, um, 
you know, let's say seven to 10 years ago is when something triggered from my values to understand, to start thinking about some of the financing we were doing and some of the um, syndications we were doing. It. Uh, but that came, you know, I didn't hear anyone talking about it. And I do study and I do listen to, you know, uh, I read, you know, as much as I can and listen to, you know, big thinkers, et cetera. But, uh, and, and, and it's funny, funny, funny thing is that, and that's again, why I do, you know, the podcast, because it's to share that thinking so that more people can think about it and then we can take action. Because as I come to learn, people like yourself have been doing this for decades or Sir Ken Robinson, right? Yeah. That you mentioned. Uh, so it's a, I, I, the challenge I have, I haven't worked it out yet, uh, team, but I'm trying to bridge that gap, you know, through, I mentioned before, through connecting people, is um, how do we move from and, and now understanding, having all this knowledge, having all this experience as well, because a lot of people, you know, I, I always like talking about uh, Mark Campanale, you know, who from Carbon Tracker Initiative, you know, other, and other many that have been working on, on, on this for, for decades, you know, how do we grasp all of that now and accelerate it, right? Which will come back to that question, by the way. Um, so, um, so I don't have the answer, Tim. That's no, I, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting you to be like the Pope, mate. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. And 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 before anybody listening thinks that I'm holier than thou, I I I am totally flawed in so many ways. I just think that one needs to have the conversations. You know, it's like what's going on in our cultures at the moment with 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 Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement. We we have known culturally for I don't know, let's say 50, 100, 150 years that we're dealing with things that aren't right. We just have never had the moment, the epiphany, if that's the way to look at it, to actually deal with it. I mean, and we should. It's morally it is it, it is morally wrong to have made the the, the 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 ridiculous distinction we've made over the color of people's skins uh, and their gender um mm -hmm. and i'm so proud of the young people that i know who regard old fogies of my generation as being like dinosaurs um and I think that's utterly marvelous and i would say to anybody who's older like me but i go into a lot of schools if you're feeling depressed, don't be. The smart youngsters at the schools all over the world are, they're just full full of brightness and quite a lot of anger about us, about how we have allowed things to get to a point where they've got them, yeah. they've got the mess. Um, hmm. But you know, there's a great phrase by Ed Wilson, the great biologist at Harvard who invented the word biodiversity. He came up with a phrase which you must all steal when you hear this. I've stolen it. I, I credit it, of course, but but it is the problems for humans are that they have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and the technology of God. And that's actually a really neat quote, actually, that that you know we we We've got to be quite forgiving of our failings, provided we commit ourselves to trying to put those failings right as soon as we recognize them. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I should mention, I should have mentioned before, if people want to learn more about it, uh, everything that we're talking about, the projects, you know, you should go to edenproject.com. Uh, very simple, and you'll find all of them. Uh, but let me again. So uh, we have so many things I would like to cover, and I know that we ha when I have a, when I have to stop at some time. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, maybe, and I talk sometimes within kind of the the theme of clients. Uh, maybe we can talk about some of your international projects uh, okay. because I know that you've been. Oh, actually, uh, it's interesting. We went upside down. I thought we were gonna go one, two, three. We were going three, two, one. But let me let me think about one and two. So Eden Project, and the one thing I was thinking about, like the example you mentioned with the Garden uh, Festival what is the one big lesson uh, and then perhaps because then it links nicely to you know why you're doing international projects right and how you're using all of these lessons to to help internationally maybe it, it, that does that make sense and the question makes sense but it's not easy to answer mm. um, the reason it's not easy to answer is if your question is tim what was the best decision you made with the eden project oh i like that one yeah but that is quite easy when we did our cost analysis uh, before we built, 
we realized that we could not build the three different biomes at the size we designed them. We couldn't afford it. So the quantity surveyors said, well, look, let's do what's um, uh, value engineering is the horrible phrase used for it. Um, and we can make see we'll make it all a bit a bit smaller. You know, it won't be bad, but we're a bit smaller. And it was then that I made the best decision I've ever made commercially. I said, who wants to go and see the second biggest conservatory in the world? No, we will get rid of an entire conservatory and retain the ambition of the first two. And that was the right decision because the public have poured in every year. I mean, we, we average 1.1 million every year now. And they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful, but they needed, culturally, they needed to be the size they are, to have that look and their proportion in the pit and all the rest of it. Um, you know, and it's been, and, yeah. it's, it's been, it's been great. And the other, the other decision, I suppose, uh, is if you take as a given that we were going to put in there the world's greatest collection of plants useful to humans, the other thing that we've done is to, um, we have an arena at Eden, which in which we've partnered with AEG, the world's biggest music company, because this is quite interesting. Uh, yes. The majority of big rock bands are fed up playing race courses, huge stately homes and festivals, because the whole experience of the intimacy of performance and the feedback with the crowd is just lost. It just becomes like super thing. It just, it's just about making money. And Eden, we have a, a brilliant arena, and this is not a boast, it's the truth. Mm. It, is the it is the best outdoor acoustic of any arena in the world. And that is an accident, to be honest, of the mining of the mine that left this brilliant tiered mm. system. There. And we can only hold 6,200 people, but all the world's big acts come and perform and they adore it because you can hear a pin drop um, uh, by which I mean, normally when you go to a big rock concert, your ears ring afterwards, it, they, they hurt. That's because in order for you to hear the trebles, uh, the trebles and things, they turn the treble up so loud that your fillings can pick up Radio Tirana. Um, <laughs> but that's because the mid range just gets foxed out. Whereas at, at Eden, you hear it exactly as the artist intended. It's the only place where Elton John has ever recorded and allowed the whole concert to just be broadcast because it, he sang in pitch the whole way that he could hear every instrument. And it's very emotional. It's, it's great. So that was the other great decision we made. Well, good decision. That's great. Mm -hmm. Was to then really go for the music side of it because people want culture. They want to be enriched by being together and with themselves. You know, um, it's not a, a low, we are very sociable creatures. And watching 6,000 people just going mad as the light fails and the, the moon comes up and the lights light up all the conservatories and some of the best bands in the world are playing makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Mm. Mm. And, and it's interesting. I, I, by the way, I've been there once uh, 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 15 years ago and to the gardens. Uh, I would have never actually imagined and dreamt back then that I was going to be talking to you. I was thinking, I was telling my family of it. Uh, our first uh, uh, lunch in the pub on Sunday, uh, how excited I was, you know, because originally we were uh, uh, speaking on Monday, right? Um, yeah. and, and I was like saying how how fascinating, you know, how life life turns. But it, what I was going to say is as well that always is, I've learned to appreciate that even if you look at pictures or videos, it, 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 it when you get there, when you get to a place like this one, it's, it's just, it's, you cannot describe. Uh, so uh, again, I, I highly, highly recommend, but I haven't been to a, to a, to a, to a show, to a concert. So maybe that's the, that's, that's the next thing. thing. That's the next thing. thing. Maybe that's we'll the, organize that. That's the next thing. That's the next thing. Um, and, uh, and the other part was, okay, so that was your best decision. Uh, and, and this is nice. This is another first. You know, no, nobody asked us them, th themselves a question before. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the other one is, uh, what about the international projects? Um, you know, you have. Uh, if you you mentioned so many, uh, I made a, a, a note. Uh, let me just remember. So you had the China project in Xinjiang, Australia Christchurch, um, 
and then you have a couple more like Costa Rica, I think. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, let, let me unpick that long sentence of yours. Uh, we have. Uh, it's funny, but we define everything outside Cornwall as being international. Yes. <laughs> um, we've got a big project in Qingdao, which is the sea, it's the marine capital of China between, it's on the coast, but it's, it, it's roughly between Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, we've got another project coming out of the ground at a place called Jizhou, which for those of you unfamiliar with the geography of China, is um, a small city which is uh, between Beijing and Tianjin. Uh, and Tianjin is, if you like, is the port of uh, Beijing, although it's 200 kilometers away. So it's right in the middle there. Um, and uh, so that's been great fun. It's been a, a huge challenge with us getting to learn how to work with our friends in China. Um, but China is a very, very interesting country to work in because culturally, it has come to terms with the fact that it must adapt very quickly to uh, turn all its energies into environmentally friendly mm. uh, routes. They are very, um, they're very upfront about the fact that their need for development throughout the 80s, 90s and early noughties um, was just essential because they needed to take the majority of their people out of poverty and into a reasonable uh, 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 expectation uh, of, of the good things in life and it, it is an astonishing act of will um, but the thing is that they, they in order to do it it has damaged the environment very significantly which they admit so now every major state-owned enterprise uh, has to have its environmental champion um, and all staff need to be educated in the low impact uh, on the environment that their activities have got to have. Our Qingdao project is right on the sea. Uh, we are, it is actually like a broken arrowhead with the point knocked off. We have rivers on either side of the arrowhead that come to the sea. And it, it, like Eden in Cornwall, the land was poisoned by nitrates and uh, the salts from um, uh, uh, shrimp farming. Uh, but now, as I speak to you, the ground floor is complete on the whole of that project, and it will be finished by the beginning of mm. 2023. Um, and that project is all about water, the cleanliness and importance of water, um, because, of course, the, the, the Chinese is the oldest civilization uh, in the world today. Um, and it was built on an understanding of water and the engineering of water. So it's actually very culturally appropriate and it's been really sweet to see how it's been well, not only welcomed, but it's being used as a driver to make people think about water, 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 water. Um, that in turn, so sort of staying with China a bit, has led to a realization that places like the what's called the Loose Plateau, um, which is the most fertile part of China along the Yellow River, um, has actually eroded so much because of the cutting down of all the trees um, that there have been terrible damage. And, you know, this last century, over 20 million people died flooding. And in places, that Yellow River is 60 metres high, actually built on stilts, you know, 60 metres high to stop this happening. But if you get on a train in Qingdao and you go to Beijing for the first hour and a bit, you just go through nurseries, lots of nurseries, tree nurseries, this is an incredible statistic. The Chinese have planted more trees in each of the last three years than in the rest of the world added up together, which is pretty amazing. Um, so anyway, we're working in China. We are aware of the moral conundrums of it. Um, mm -hmm. you, I'm sure you, having heard me banging on about morality, your next question was going to be a rapier through my side, wasn't it? About how do you feel about uh, China's uh, relationship with some of its own people. Um, I, I wouldn't duck that question. All I would say is that at present, my judgment is that the greatest problem in the world existentially is the climate and biodiversity. Therefore, if our operating in China with our Chinese friends enables us to make a real big difference in terms of awareness of all of this, it will be 
in terms of weighing up in balance all the considerations that one might have would be more important than any other gesture we might make. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also say that we all have many friends who may have habits we don't like. Um, the question is, at what point are they so intolerable that you actually never invite them around? Um, and I'm just really excited knowing all that you might throw at me about China. I think the people are so smart, their commitment is so total that if I had to bank the future of the planet on one nation being able to help us get to another side, it would be China. So I would much rather well, be a friend of China than not so. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for uh, for the, for for the extra question and answer. <laughs> so, well, uh, the other thing, the other thing is we're in Christchurch. Uh, Christchurch is the capital of South Island, New Zealand, um, and we are building in the earthquake zone there. Um, and in Australia, we are working at a place called Anglesey Mine, which is a huge coal mine, which has been restored. Um, and in both those places, uh, which is on the Gold Coast, you know, the uh, Great Ocean Road below Melbourne. Um, but both those projects, our partners are um, native peoples, uh, indigenous peoples, or the traditional owners, which is what is the other way of describing people. Um, and in, in, in Christchurch, it is with the Iwi Maori, and in uh, Anglesey, in uh, uh, Victoria, uh, it's um, with the Wadawurrum people. I have become fascinated late in life, having been an anthropologist, but it's really fascinating to revisit, say, one's relationships or exploring the knowledge base of indigenous peoples. And you then realize that so much of the, if you like, racist approach to indigenous people is to do with the very poor quality of translation there was of what indigenous people were saying. So you ended up with kind of childlike mm. Uh, commentary, which in the, in truth bore no semblance to uh, uh, what their culture was like. And this last year, I read a book. If anybody wants to be recommended a book that will go through your brain like a clear mountain stream, it is by a man called Bruce Pascoe, and the book is called Dark Emu, and it will leave your jaw slack. It is the true story of the colonization. Um, of Australia before the British doctored what you heard. Um, so basically, the story we as Brits got was of Aboriginal peoples just doing um, hunter gathering and then getting getting into dream time and all of that sort of stuff. It was rather quaint. They were supposed to be just a bit out of it. Um, in truth, the very, very first explorers who wrote about Australia talk about towns of 7,000, 8,000 people, about fish farms and fish trapping on all the major rivers that went 30 miles up the rivers, of feasting of tribes from thousands of miles away coming to stay for a month with others. These people were brilliant. They understood how to use fire to clean scrub mm. um, and so on. And th that book, Dark Emu, it's the strangest sort of stra strangest of the weirdest Bibles you'll ever read, because as you read it, you wonder whether the great joke of humankind will be that a country like Australia that hasn't have, doesn't have very much fertility in its land, uh, land may well come over the next 50 years to depend on techniques which they're rediscovering from the original owners who owned the land. So for any of you who have ever been to Australia, one of the great deserts is Van Diemen land. Let me tell you, the Aboriginal peoples who lived in Van Diemen's land, they discovered this extraordinary technique of making huge plates of clay, thin plates of clay with a slight curve, which they put under the desert sand so that when the dew formed at night, it would percolate through the sand and be captured in the clay trays under the, under the sand to be able to provide the nurture the, and, and, and liquid for the oats and, 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 and early uh, corns to grow and it's just a stunning book you, your jaw just hits the thing and then they, they, it reproduces a letter from the colonial office saying there will be no mention of this they're from now on they're just to be indigent people who've got no stake in the land because we do not as britain want to ever have to deal with people with competing 
claims to land. These people are stateless, landless, and just travel around it. The book was again by Bruce Bruce Pasco. Pasco. And is that and Dark, Dark Emu. Emu. Thank you. It's, it's so exciting, JP. Isn't it funny how when when well you're a bit younger than me, but in 1969, when I was sort of Uh, starting to enjoy my teenage years and you know the whole world you know what the world is stardust and it was hippie and you know you smoked the odd joint and it was just fantastic you got went away with the fairies and we believed that the whole world was just full of stardust that was that's what was made science said that's absolutely rubbish that's just that's not what life is over the course of my lifetime the world of scientific knowledge has come closer and closer to those early sentiments to the point where we now know that we are made predominantly of bacteria. We, we have an invisible ecology of, of bacteria, which is stunning. Just 30 years ago, didn't almost everybody think that the Japanese were rather quaint for believing that we had a second brain? Isn't it also rather amazing that most, most uh, European centers of medicine are now thinking that the stomach and the gut and whatever are absolutely central to the well-being of humans and on the other side you have the extraordinary work that's been done um, at the moment the best-selling book in britain a uh, factual book is called entangled life by merlin sheldrake um, and that is a book about the mycorrhiza the, 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 the tiny fungi webs called the wood wide web that is in the soil isn't it astonishing that what was thought to be hippie shit years ago that trees speak to each other and they communicate with bushes and they they help the weakest ones survive by moving sugars around a system and unbelievably they look and work almost exactly the same as the microbiome in your stomach and my stomach and everything else how lucky are our young people today in a world which has become perhaps um less certain uh in its if you like spiritual direction we live in a largely secular age Isn't it astonishing that at such a time, science may provide an insight into life on Earth, which is truly astonishing, that we are all Beautiful. Earth creatures. We are all Earthlings. And I think that's very moving. And I wish I was younger because I just think, I think the next 15 years are going to be the most exciting since humans came down from trees to the savannas. I really, I really do. Nice. And, you know, and the last thing I would say is people must stop reading newspapers. They must. They, they owe it to their mental health. Remember, these guys have a mantra, and their mantra is, if it bleeds, it leads. We must put bad news on the front pages because people are more interested in it. It's their psychological frisson. But after a while, it makes you mentally ill because you believe that everything's going to hell in a handcart, and it is not. Mm -hmm. I hear you, I second it, and I actually tell that to everyone to do the same, same with watching the news. Um, I, I just, just before we move away from the international side, yeah, uh, and thank you so, so much for that again, uh, Tim, really, really value it and appreciate it. And, and it is all gold dust. I, I feel that actually what we're doing right now and what you're sharing is, is, is gold dust again. So um, it's a good, good point to make. Um, but I was, I was telling you uh, before offline that a, a young lady is, is a, uh, based out of Hawaii uh, connected with me and I, I told him, um, I told her about you and the work you're doing. So I just wanted to just quickly maybe touch upon a couple of the questions as a listener that she asked. Uh, her name is Andrea Bachman. That's a quick shout out. Uh, she um, works on the Leeward. Oh, I'm going to try this one. It's going to be hard. Lee, Leeward Haleakala watershed restoration partnership which is lhwrp.org and the and uhi way or aleakala which is uhiwai.org and they manage about 45,000 acres uh, in maui uh, dedicated to protection and restoration and she uh, you were already answering quite a few of the questions you know but i thought that uh, it would be just just a couple more perhaps to you know because you mentioned about the, the specific project but there's two maybe that come to mind maybe th three but again we don't have to make it too too long in terms of the answer but i'm sure that we can have even another session just with her and, and on this but which one is the 
so how do you get these businesses? How does it work? That's what the one question I, I think about, you know, so maybe people like like her and their organization and what is 45,000? Uh, what, what, what does that translate into maybe for people? 45,000 acres, that sounds like a lot, right? Um, but yeah. how, how do they learn from people like you that are taking your experiences and your, and your services out to other countries? How, how does that happen? Generally, we get approached by people mm -hmm. who say we've got some, we always say, bring us your poison. Mm -hmm. And they say, we've got some poisoned land and nasty land. Would you come work with us? So that's why we ended up in the earthquake zone in Christchurch and why we ended up at a mine in Australia. Um, and um, actually, we then, uh, the last project we've done, which is just going, is just about to open, is in Dubai. We've done the centerpiece for um, uh, the Expo 2020, which is actually opening in 2021 which is a, 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 it's the most extraordinary theatrical uh, interpretation of what sustainability means. It's very rock and roll. And the Emiratis have been incredibly brave in commissioning us to do it because it's not like any other show ever anywhere. Um, and uh, we're very interested in that because Oscar Wilde always used to say, no one remembers the well-mannered person at a party. Um, and I, I take that to mean that what is the point of all these boring men going around the world to conferences to make speeches that no one wants to hear, that no one will ever remember? Why did they not say something that was interesting? Why did they just say what they expected their peer group uh, uh, to have said? Gosh, it's so life sapping to see them. And I, I, I hate to keep bore, uh, battling on with boring middle aged men, but they tend not to deal with the real big issues. You can talk about economic botany till the cows come home, but if you're not brave enough to talk about equity, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? you've actually just, oh, I, I can only deal with this, but it's actually pointless if you don't deal to sta a dead stand up and deal with the big issues. So we get approached by people. We turn a lot of people down. I say, look, we're, we're of an age that if you haven't got the money to do this, or you can't persuade the stakeholders where you are to put up the money, we're not interested because it takes us too much time. And now um, we operate, all of our projects have a mix of philanthropy, state finance and private finance. The reason is we want that, that healthy hybrid vigor. You want the, the continuous testing of the public goods with the commercial operational talents um, uh, and to also have the generosity of spirit to be able to do things that are not for strict profit, mm. but the great social benefit wherever you are. And, and most people actually applaud that. That's why in Britain, we're doing um, a lovely project up in uh, uh, the Northwest in Lancashire, in Morecambe, at Morecambe Bay. And that's been great. I mean, Morecambe, as you know, it was, was, was rather haunted by a terrible accident some years ago when 20 Chinese cockle pickers got drowned because for those of you who are from abroad who don't know Morecambe, it is one of the wonders of the world uh, in one particular way that the bay, the tide comes in faster. I want you to think about this. It comes in faster than a galloping horse. Just imagine you've walked a mile out into, onto the sands and the tide starts coming in. It is truly terrifying. There is a, a man called the Queen's Master of the Sands who knows exactly when to walk the 30 miles across to from one place to the other. Uh, and it's one of the great privileges in life to be with a person who can read what looks like a landscape that no one could read and get you safely from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're, so we're building yeah. there. Unanimous desire of the people of Morecambe for us to do that. Um, we're doing the same in Dundee, a city in Scotland, um, which is a very different project. I should also say that each one of our projects is different. We never copy what we've done before, and our partners are different in each. Ap apologies, you remember again, how do you spell it? More, come? more, as in much more. Yeah. And then CAM, C A M B E. Okay, perfect. And thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And then maybe I'll, I'll state the obvious, which is uh, never great, but uh, I, obviously you have millions of people visiting you. 
uh, and it's a pretty well known uh, place and project. And also, you personally have you know have you know created you know for 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 your scenes you know quite quite the profile right. So uh, that kind of marketing side is almost organic, right? So hence why you get so many people approaching you. Is that fair to say? Yeah, but I'm pretty old and I'm pretty ugly. <laughs> but, no, you're pretty, I, but you're pretty funny. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky that people talk to me um, about what I've done, but they know that I'm an ordinary bloke. And, and it's great because people talk to me as if they've known me all my life. And I'm, honestly, I can walk through the town, our, our nearby town, and mm -hmm. I, there'll be people I've never met who come up and they'll start talking to me as if we just met in the pub. Yeah, and, I can imagine that, yeah. But but it's such a privilege. The mm. day you get bored or annoyed with that, you should shoot mm. yourself. No, mm. it, 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 it is marvellous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, and one thing, if yeah, if you don't mind me saying, I've never met, I think, somebody that basically is insulting people, but it doesn't feel like an insult. You know, like when the point you made about the the auditors, the made the point that you are calling all of, call on, on all of this behavior as well. You know, it's, it's, it's quite a yeah, it's something I'm taking away definitely from 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 your team, and I had to learn. You know how because I, I I think I picked up some of the many things you share where it comes from, like the Oscar Wilde uh, uh, phrase that you that you quoted. Um, uh, but uh, but I think it's it's quite a skill. Um, yeah, and so see, that, one, of, one of the things, JP, is this, that we, I, just like you, am a very flawed person. I'm a very flawed yes, person. Yes, amen. Um, and therefore, when I criticize auditors, I'm doing it in fellowship, not in enmity. Yeah. Because I recognize that they're as flawed as I am. And I also know that an awful lot of my auditor friends would like to be better than they are professionally, just like I would. Mm. Um, and... I think provided provided your criticism is if you like the criticism of a brother rather than someone who's trying to create a war, you can achieve far, far more. And the way you do that is by just being lightly humorous. You've got to be lightly humorous. The trouble is no one changes their mind when you behave like an old fashioned Old Testament prophet and wag your finger and tell people that there's going to be, you know, fire and brimstone and that you are behaving just mm -hmm. terribly. I don't know about you, but I have never, ever changed my opinion when someone shouted at me. Hmm. I hear you. Marvellous. Question about, you've done all of this, you mentioned you do all the projects are different, you know, you've been uh, around. We actually didn't touch, you mentioned SDGs uh, briefly at the beginning, uh, but people are kind of getting obsessed about the whole measurement, right, piece impact measurement impact measurement um and i i didn't uh, you know try to find if you had a specific methodology or uh, because the diversity of what you're doing but do you have any one thing that you with the trust measure or or a methodology that people should check out the lying answer is lots of things lots and lots of things the truth no mm -hmm. i think uh, we 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 do measure our carbon. You mentioned before, yeah, you're gonna measure like the data is your thing because you measure, yeah. you know, uh, consequences of your of every action you take on the land, etc. I heard. Land, on, yeah, on the land and on the water and on the carbon, yes, we do. But we're very nervous about all of this because we've created a dialogue around carbon, which is very unhealthy. Carbon is the building block of all life on Earth, and we seem to be treating it like it's a cancer we're suffering from. It's not, it's, it's, it's the, the, the problem is we've got fugitive carbon, you know, it's kind of like escape, it, it's come out too quickly. And we need to work out how, you know, I mean, if you look at the soil of Britain, uh, in fact, the soil of the world, um, it was probably around double the, uh, the carbon in the soil uh, in Roman days than it is today. So if you look at all of the land that is currently farmed and you imagine actually farming it healthily, that's a heck of a lot of carbon you can absorb. That's a lot of carbon you can absorb. If you then stop putting shit into the oceans and enable us to stop putting um, chemicals into the uh, sea that are bad for the sea, and then your phyto and zooplankton start to grow exponentially, they absorb more more carbon than the whole of the rainforest of the world. Um, 
we just got to see this as a, as a big challenge to just behave badly. We're like an annoying teenager that needs to bloody well clean up their room. Mm. When you start seeing the human species like that, it becomes just a bit easier. Mm. Um, mm. The thing mm-hmm. I haven't, the thing I haven't talked about, which of course you were about to ask me about, was about are we going to have something on every inhabited continent? Well. At the moment, we have a project on every inhabited continent. We've got one in Australia and Christchurch, that's Australia. We've got China, is Asia. We've got uh, a project uh, which is really exciting and really dangerous in uh, Chad uh, in the middle of Africa. Uh, in Europe, obviously, we've got our own projects. Um, in America, we've got a project uh, in uh, South Carolina um, at a place called Graniteville. Um, and then in Latin America, Central Latin America, we have the coolest project you can imagine um, in Costa Rica, um, where we have got a 10,000 acre rainforest that was, this goes back to the start of the interview, this goes back to impact investing, right? Those acres, 10,000 of them, were, were part of a 42 different farms where the land was degraded and the person, the uh, 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 the Danish philanthropist um, uh, who purchased it, uh, what he did was uh, he uh, he was called Peter Koland, and he put a fence around all ten thousand acres. And you know what he said? Mm-hmm. No humans may go in here for the next twenty years. The birds will shit it back to life. So this country side this countryside at Matambu which is in the Nicoya Peninsula on the Pacific coast of uh, Costa Rica the nearest town was called Paquera a place of 8,000 souls every year there were murders many murders because of drought the, the water ran out and for five months of the year livestock died people were in great poverty until the rainforest started to grow back. And then you should hear the mayor of Paquera talk about the majesty of seeing the heat haze over the mountain suddenly create clouds and rain would fall. And year by year, this whole new vision erupted. So today, for 365 days of every year, four, four rivers flow out of that rainforest and they provide the water for Paquera. The people of Paquera believe that they've had a second coming. They actually believe it is religious, that they've been Mm. given Mm. a second chance of life. So they formed their own fire brigades to make sure there are no fires as a voluntary activity. And we're now talking to them with our friends at Hotel Chocolat um, to see about growing forest cacao, cocoa. Yeah. to create livelihoods, because one of the really important things about the wild is we must not think of humans and the wild having to be kept separate. That is, a, uh, that's how you create enemies. What you need is to find ways in which humans can work in and with the wild. So we're looking with uh, Hotel Chocolat about how can we uh, create a brand within Hotel Chocolat to raise funds to buy more land uh, to put it into protection and to pay good. Uh, livelihoods to the people of Pacara. Hmm. And this is all really, really exciting uh, hmm. to look at because that's what we started when we were talking about impact investment. That is real impact investment. And let me tell you, the it's, biggest it's, impact on us who work on that project was just two months ago. We put heat seeking cameras in that rainforest. And about a year ago, we got our first ocelots started to come in and puma. But two or three months ago, I can't remember exactly which day, uh, we got the first pictures back from the middle of the jungle of a jaguar. Now, isn't that cool that you've got the regeneration of 10,000 acres of forest? We're going to create an economic use for it. The biodiversity is back Mm -hmm. uh, and, and growing all the time. And this is humans being smart. So everybody who's an impact investor uh, listening today should be so excited about the potential of your money, because if you invest your money right, you will not only get a return on that money, but you'll get this incredible buzz in your soul for the excitement of the things you've been able to do, giving nature a helping hand to put it right. And that has got to be something that must be surely 
of all the rewards you could get on planet Earth to have the chance to put your intelligence to work, to give nature a helping hand and make a little bit of money on the side, isn't that nobility? Mm. Isn't that truly mm. happiness? Yes, yes. And, and, and the big point there is how uh, environment and nature, you know, creates effect on the society that, you know, people, because that's the other part about measurement that keep, people keep talking about, you know, that they struggle with the societal uh, impact. Uh, but uh, in many, many cases, it's, it's a bit more long term. And it's interesting you mentioned, uh, what was the name of the, the Danish man again? Peder, spelled P E D R. Yeah. Kolind, spelled K O H L I N D. And his nice son, his son is the Eden Project lead in that rainforest project today. Nice, nice. And it's interesting because I mentioned to you uh, um, there is a, a, a younger generation guy called uh, Zach Efron, uh, which is a, a film star, you know, quite famous. And he has a series of documentaries. I don't know if you've seen them, uh, Down to Earth. And this, yeah, yeah this yeah. one of them, which is in Costa Rica, uh, where they show, I don't know, actually, I'm going to double check if it is maybe the same place, because they show how, um, how terrible it was before they closed everything, before they started doing the regeneration. And it only, I think it was within five or 10 years, the whole biodiversity kind of was reinstalled. Um, uh, so I remember that. Uh, and it's funny, I come coming from a, from a hot country and, and Latin America, I actually never had, had never seen a, a cacao before. So I saw it on that documentary for the first time, you know, how ah. they take it out uh, and how they eat it. And it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm gonna sound ignorant again, but it's okay. It's a, it's a flower, right? So it's the, and then they open it and it's like, and it comes like this beautiful and they describe it, I haven't seen it actually in my life, so. It look, imagine, imagine a very, very big avocado mm. that is yellow, a, a, an ochre type yellow with uh, a, a bit of coppery brown and that will be it. Mm. It is, it is, they are amazing because light... But that's outside, right? But then inside it's, it's white, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, when you cut it open, you have a white pulp yeah. all around it, and then you have the cacao seeds. Yeah. But actually, those who live in cacao-rich countries know that the pulp is even better than the cacao. Mm. I mean, it's mm. lovely. Mm. And in Argentina and in um, Brazil, the greatest delicacy, the favorite fruit, is in fact a, a member of that cacao family. Uh, the Latin of it, um, the cocoa is called Theobrahma cacao, uh, but the fruit which is so prized in Brazil and Argentina is called Theobrahma grandiflora, which is just the pulp. It, it's basically a, a, a relative which, without the cacao seeds, is just that pulp, which is just amazingly amazing i'm glad i'm glad the west uh, uh, has not caught on to that or else we'd be cutting it even more down no, mm. i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking it is, it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. the other interesting thing about cocoa uh, cacao just like uh coffee uh what's the word for it they 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 grow out of the when you see it growing the little flowers come out on the bark of the tree as opposed to like ordinary flowers at the end of the leaves and whatever, these are actually coming out of the bark of the trees and the main <laughs> branches. And they like, they're, they're like little yellow flowers uh, and, and they suddenly start turning into a pod. And then they grow like they're sucking the tree dry right, and they get, and they get, I mean, uh, they're, big, yeah. they're yeah. big, they're big, they're big. And um, it's amazing. We've got 27 varieties of cacao at Eden. If you're, if you're, if you're feeling as if your life is, um, not been valued enough because you've never seen cacao, come to Eden. What an irony that a man of the South Americas should come to Cornwall to see his native fruit. I, I promise you, I, I, because I, I am on this kind of awareness journey, right? When I, when I saw that and I thought like, how come I never actually seen a cacao? You know, it's, it just really caught my attention and it was like nothing what I could have imagined. So I thought it was worth uh, mentioning. So thank you very much for the descriptive uh, uh, explanation as well. I'm sure that people will uh, be just imagining just by listening to it. Um, listen, uh, Tim, I think as we start wrapping up, um, 
interesting. I have like the last couple of questions and, and, and one of them is kind of to dig a little bit more about you, but it's been fascinating because, you know, I tend to ask people what drives them, uh, you know, what you care most about. I think it's all kind of very self-evident, um, you know, uh, who inspire you, but also you mentioned so many people, uh, friends and, and, and others, but perhaps I don't know if it's, it's two things that, you know, and again, you have had the most amazing and rich life. Uh, you know, I, I just, just reading about you, uh, if you don't mind me saying, um, uh, it just energized me, you know, just reading all the activities, you know, what you've done, have you gone about it? And, um, uh, and I, I think uh, uh, the same happened to, to Andrea when I, when she didn't know about you and I told her, oh, I'm going to have this conversation with Tim Smith. Do you know him? And he's like, no, she went away and I promise you, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I told you, I'm going to share some of the things that she wrote to me. What, what you generate, right, is, 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 uh, is truly, truly inspirational. Um, but, and, and we were talking about before, you studied in Sussex, in Kent, you know, so kind of close to where I am now. Uh, but is there like one or two, like really pivotal mo moments, you know, that in your life that you went like, you know, that kind of made it, or perhaps linking it to someone in your life that made that happen? Well, I was very lucky that, I was sent to an English public school against my wishes. I hated very much the loneliness of being just just before my seventh birthday arriving at a prep school in Britain because my dad was a uh, worked for KLM Airlines uh, mm -hmm. and he was posted to Turkey and there were no English or Dutch schools there. So I was sent to England because my mother was English, my father was Dutch. Um, and I was very lucky that there was a master um, who had this extraordinary moustache, you know, it was like a walrus moustache, and he had these piercing eyes and glasses and always wore a tweed jacket with leather patches, and he, um, he could recognise every bird outside, every tree outside, and he loved, he loved nature, um, but he talked about it as being just this amazing gift that we'd been given to land in this place and these his job was to reveal the secrets of the natural world so we would start to compete seeing the most amount of birds and we would look under rocks and uh, look at looking for toads and things and that smell of as you lift a rock and the ferns get mm. crushed that moist soil and crushed fern just like when you go pond dipping that smell of pond weed mud and slightly stagnant water just brings back an ocean of memories. And that was com combined in this extraordinary man who um, uh, every day he ate a raw onion just by slicing one bit off after another and would swallow it. And he said it'd be a secret of a long life. Well, I'm not in exactly sure whether it was a secret of a long life, but he inspired so many of us because in the evening, and he didn't have to, we all lived in dormitories. And he'd come and he would read us these great adventure stories. So we'd be tucked up in bed and he would get onto this throne like wooden chair and he would read us things like King Solomon's Mines um, uh, 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 and The Lost Worlds by Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes and Brigadier Gerard. So my, my, my whole brain was populated by adventurers and extraordinary encounters in the pages of these books. And then in daytime, I was sort of kind of being shown the natural world as if it was also this immense privilege and we had to grab it as if we were thirsty for knowledge right now because we'd never get the chance again. He was just the most brilliant and inspirational teacher. Um, and uh, it's very funny, he, he's, he was called Tom Gilbart and I did an interview with the Times Educational Supplement some years ago and I just happened to mention that he'd been my great inspiration not knowing that his son who was a huge fan of the Times Educational Supplement and uh, he phoned me up because he said it was just such a lovely thing to see his dad remind, remembered in that way. But, it, but that, that I say this to all adults um, listening right now, is, is that example has made me very aware that I must make time. I must make time to read my grandchildren's stories and whatever because it's only the people closest to you that make themselves close to you that can actually convey the essence of who you are in terms of what excites you. 
so that they will remember you long after you're dead, but with a warm smile because you created these unforgettable moments. And I feel very sad for people who are a bit like me and probably a bit like you, who perhaps think you're doing something really important by working that extra hour or doing that extra deal or whatever. How sad are we? We, we, we should also give ourselves a good slapping with a bit of wet fish and commit ourselves to making sure that every month we've given each one of the people that's valuable to us a memory, a moment that they will carry warmly for year after year. And I think that's a terrific thing to put down as a, not a, don't make it a New Year's resolution. Mm. Be random, be brave, make it a end of May resolution because that way you're bound to keep it. <laughs> very nice, very nice. I, 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 I'm very intentional about that. I have it on my kind of weekly and daily, you know, even if it is just by using um, technology on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the better way, you know, just um, um, kind of, texting somebody or calling somebody or especially my daughters i think my, i try to like just be on their be, <laughs> be on their on their on their minds uh, as much as i can uh because it, it takes nothing these days right so or nothing in terms of you know it, it's almost automatic you know we have the technology of god yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna use that one um yeah. and and well, and well can i tell you one last thing on this yeah yeah i when i learned to scuba dive I learned to scuba dive in 1972, and um, I went to a place called Fort Bovisand in Plymouth. And it was me, imagine this, a slightly podgy middle-class boy and six men from the special boat squadron. They were like really tough. And anyway, at the end of the six weeks of dive training, um, they held this party and they invited me to join them because they thought it was antisocial. And at the end of it, we drank a lot of whiskey and suddenly they all stood up and they they said, one, two, three, four. It's four o'clock. It's 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 four a.m. Aberdeen. We're in. And everybody punched their fists together. I did it, of course. And I said, what have I just punched the air for? <laughs> I just I was like a sheep. And they said, it's 4 a.m. You've committed the worst crime that is possible. You're in the worst trouble, the worst deprivation. Just imagine the worst thing. Who will you call? What you've just pledged is that you will be available for a phone call. Now, what's really interesting about that is they then said, you need to go through your address book and find the four people that you would entrust with your life. And I discovered something incredible in doing that, that many of the people you socialize with or spend time with, you would not trust your life with. And yet some of the people you have ignored over years, but you still keep vaguely in touch with, they are special, but you somehow you've taken them for granted. So I think as well as finding stories for your children, go through your address book and think of the people that actually matter to you, but you've taken them so much for granted, you haven't bothered to make a call or write a letter or arrange for anything. And I say this to all my mates and they all say, thank you, I've just done that. And it was different. We're all like that. We live, we live lives where we can, we forget, we just do the urgent rather than the important. Mm. I, I'm, I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna take that and I'm, um, last two. And actually, one of them may be already answered with what you just said, you know, which is I tend to ask uh, for, for kind of a final call to action, but maybe you can do one more specific to even more specific to Eden and, and to, you know, your, your, your area or to impact investing, right? Um, uh, but you also mentioned a few as well through the conversation, which I really appreciate. And one last one and uh, on the back of uh, Tom Gilbert, you know, and, and everyone that you have worked with and met through your life in terms of being what I call it an impact leader, right? So what, what makes you know, an impact leader, you think, in terms of uh, uh, actions or characteristics? I think impact leaders are very interesting psychologically because they, in order to be effective, they need to be vain. They need to have a degree of arrogance. And yet at the same time, they have to be able to ride the horse of humility. And it's, it's, it, it is almost that contradiction which makes people special because they know that nobody wants to get on a stage with people who are saying, it's my idea, my idea, my idea. 
and yet they also know that you need to be strong enough to have the idea to actually create something that people, if you like, coalesce around. It's, so impact leaders are very interesting people in general. They are a bit schizophrenic uh, in terms of their self-knowledge about their vanity and also their humility, which is bonkers. I feel it in myself. I'm sure you do. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very funny thing. Mm -hmm. I think because also we are all we are all uh, plagued by feeling like imposters. You know, we all think we're imposters. A great chum of mine was the boss of Rolls Royce, and I asked him how he felt. He said, "I just don't believe that." I got away with it, you know, and everybody I know who's successful, they 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 say it's lucky, isn't it? <laughs> because no one actually believes they're worthy of the big things. Um, and but all I would say is that if you're lucky enough to be there, actually one of the most endearing things is to admit you don't have all the answers, mm. but, but be very arrogant about saying my skill is finding the people who are clever enough to know those answers, and that's what I'm good at. So that way you don't have to take any of the responsibility for the good ideas, but you do take the responsibility for having created the most wonderful group of people that are going to deliver those ideas. Hmm. I, I am, I am, I am. I can, um, so vain, arrogant, humble, bit of, with a bit of schizo, a bit impostor, it's all good. Um, but uh, it's something that I've been experiencing for some reason this year, uh, if I may share, which is you know quite liberating you know through through you know it happens to be for me that is through my life experience and then now by, uh, through Jesus and God and the study of the Bible that is that um, that worth it part that you mentioned that when you realize that really that you are not worth it it's another it's another way to liberate yourself from seeking worth. Um, you know, for our, that's what I always tell people, even if you don't believe, some of the concepts are quite, quite interesting. And, and I, I, word, I, I like that word liberating because once you realize that it's not about you uh, and it's really about, you know, others and the bigger cause. And you mentioned it before in one of the answers around, you know, going out there and helping and, you know, and, 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 and doing good. Uh, maybe you said in different words, you know, that's what really, really matters. Um, kind of what people, you know, from from reading to your grandchildren uh, and and uh, to to helping anyone because that warm feeling in your heart that you leave on people, you know, what there is that phrase, you know, people forget what you say but they never forget how you make them feel. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I love that phrase. Uh, so I'm learning, you know, I'm learning. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, and then the last one is, uh, yeah, um, you know, any fi final call to action and how can people get in touch with you? Um, well, you can get in touch with me at uh, tsmith at edenproject.com. It comes straight to me, no dots, tsmith, T-S-M-I-T, at edenproject.com. Um, and uh, if it was a call to action, it would be um, just say something every day that shocks people. I don't mean that you start swearing as if you've got some kind of mental problem. I, I, I mean, be thoughtful and don't, don't become the person that other people have carelessly thought you are. Always be an act of growth. I need to, I need to share one thing with you, actually. Please. That at the age of 37, I made a decision which changed my life. Unlike you, it wasn't to find God, it was to find chance. I realized that if I wanted to live a life of ordered boredom, I would do what people expected of me and I would meet the people that I was expected to meet. And I realized that the truly interesting people were the people you didn't know you needed to meet. And the only way I could meet people like that was to accept every third invitation I receive. It's not that I don't accept the first, but I always accept the third. And the reason for that is only that way can you put yourself in the social jeopardy of meeting a new group of people. And for you to be healthy, you must always be meeting new people. And if you want to know why, there's a brilliant book called Some um, by David Eagleman, which is a humorous book. But it starts, uh, each chapter is only three pages long, and it starts by saying, imagine you're going to die and all your friends die with you and you're going to paradise. Look around you and now imagine eternity.
Think about it. Think how boring that would be to be with the same people all of that time. The, the downside, the other side of that is the other part, which is um, to not persuade yourself that your best friends were always made at school and at university. In Britain, this is a real illness. It means that people are op not open to making new friendships. Uh, and actually, to keep yourself always open to making new friendships is a really healthy thing. Um, because actually, if you're a good judge of character, it will only take you a couple of days to work out whether someone um, is to your t liking, because you're cleverer now that you're the older age you were. You don't need to s share smelly socks and bad food with people at university and school you, uh, over three years. You can do it in two days. So get out there, meet new people, and it'll change your life. It changed mine, ab absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it's changing mine, and... Uh... You know, you're my new best friend, Tim. So, uh, <laughs> um, but it's it's exactly that, you know. And I I do like pointing out to people what you just said. You know, the fact that you know we are talking, the mention, the fact that Andrea, that all the way in Hawaii, found out about you, and and is this uh, you know, this the, the world today has so many ways also to meet people, uh, you know, physically, virtually, uh, and virtually beyond actually meeting and, and hopefully this episode is gonna go around uh, and the video uh you know to touch a lot of uh, of souls and brains so uh really really uh, appreciate it tim thank you so so much my pleasure my pleasure uh, and it's it's friday night here uh, friday and, uh, then you know that song yeah, <laughs> sunday <absolutely>. sunday <laughs> yeah, indeed indeed so I, <laughs> yeah. I shall now go out and walk some dogs whose legs are crossed very so, very good so just before i go uh, uh, uh let me read just the, the end the end part of the episode so that you enjoy as well which is to take the opportunity to invite uh anyone that's listening to partner with me and impact leaders and uh, we want to help and do more to raise awareness and create action uh beyond uh, uh sustainable and impact investing as you can tell so the podcast is one of the catalytic initiatives that we are running. Uh, if you want to become a, a patron now, we have the opportunity. So you can go to bit.ly forward slash capital L, capital I, capital P for, for patron. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you in advance. And the last part is that we're also looking for three founder sponsors to support our mission to enable the transition of capital. Uh, and specifically also for 10 impact leaders interested to join our program that we actually just launched uh, so you can register your interest contact us through the page or contact uh, register your interest on bit.ly forward slash il club and capital L, capital i capital l uh, to register uh, your interest again so it is bye for now until our next uh, amazing episode of impact leaders uh, god bless you all thank you goodbye Fantastic. bye bye thank you for listening to impact leaders impact leaders is brought to you by ila and partners Please connect with us to work together in the transition of capital into sustainable and impact investing.